Hello, everyone. Uh, it is the end of the day, so we should all just stand up for a minute, if you can, because you're going to fall asleep if you don't. <laughs> all right. So there's an issue that happens when you use your computer too much. So just take your wrists and go. <laughs> this gets the blood kind of flowing. At least this is what like my physical therapist says. You can even like you can even grab your arms right here and go. <laughs> Sometimes it hurts. Uh, it probably will. You're all computer nerds. <laughs> anyway, you could do jumping jabs too, but that would probably hit your neighbor. So I'm not going to recommend that since you already made friends with everybody in the audience. So uh, thank you so much. You can all sit down. I should tell you that before I start. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm going to talk about column technology or design for the Internet of Things as we now know it. Who's heard this quote before? No one's raised their hand. Okay, there's a few people. So this quote, for like two years, this quote kept getting used again and again. There's, all, there's going to be all these different devices. And they, it was always at these conferences where it's like, the more devices we have, the more of a utopian society we're going to get. We will have microchips in everything. And everybody will be, be producing microchips. There will be microchips in your hats and your shoes. There'll be microchips in your feet. It started to sound like a Dr. Seuss book. Um, and, and so I said, you know, I'm going to take the opposite approach. I'm going to say, does that actually sound good at some point in time? If we do get this utopian future of these 50 billion things, are we going to have this perfect society in which everything informs us about everything that's going right or wrong? And I, I decided I would consider a few things. Like when I first set up my smartwatch, it mirrored every single interaction that I had on my phone. It didn't say, this is a smartwatch, and this is a new behavior that you might want to experience. We're just going to mirror everything that's on your phone. So I got all these alerts for all these different things, and I had to manually turn everything off. Right? So there was a smartwatch. And then I, I kept going to these design firms, and their clients were always talking about the smart fridge and the smart kitchen, and that maybe you want to have an egg minder in your fridge that tells you when you're out of eggs. So that when you get to the store, you get an alert that says you're out of eggs. Or maybe that the banana that's out on your counter has gone bad. And I said, look, a banana has a skin on it that tells you when it's bad. <laughs> it's evolved to have, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a set it down and play. It's not even a plug and play. You just set it down on the counter, and it'll tell you when it's bad. <laughs> Tomatoes do the same thing. There are already all of these products that have figured it out a long time ago. Why do we need additional things? Look, you can look in your fridge before you go to the store. Do I have eggs? No. <laughs> Did I need to ask the web or set up an API or like have an argument with my boss whether that feature should exist or not? No. There's no eggs in the fridge. I personally don't want to go home to my house at night and have to deal with more technology. I'm there to relax. I don't want to have to be a system administrator to live in my own home. So when you put all these things together, you get what I call the dystopian kitchen of the future, in which in order to open the door, you have to download the newest, the newest virus update. Uh, or you, I, I tried this design scenario where people would make the most obnoxious design. And there was, there was one about, make a, make a fridge that helps people lose weight. And so these, these people got into groups, and they said, OK, here's the fridge that makes people lose weight. We're going to lock the door. And only at a certain times of the day can you open the door. I'm like, well, what happens if the person has to run out you know, somewhere, and then they come back and like, oh, sorry, you missed your feeding time. So like, <laughs> you can't open the fridge anymore. You know, there's all these dystopian things. And then, you know, well, if you can't use your fridge at all, then someone's going to just buy prepackaged goods and eat them in the corner because they can't open their door to get into the fresh vegetables. And they turned all the alerts off because their bananas are not doing very well anymore. And they can't get to the bananas, so the bananas aren't going bad, and everything just shouts at them at the same time. Anyway, we already have a version of this. We're living in an era of interruptive technology. Um, I know that there have been many people who have had you know, the, the Nest thermostats or the fire alarms go off randomly. And, and as everybody knows, a fire alarm going off happens a lot, and it's usually not because there's a fire. It's because, oops, somebody burnt the popcorn. And it's more of an embarrassment than it is something that is life-threatening. Like you, you can set up different alert styles for a fire alarm in your bedroom. It's probably going to be a fire if it's in the bedroom. If it's in the kitchen, it's probably not going to be. It's probably going to be user error in front of a stove. And so you have to kind of think about, like, when is an alert appropriate? What, this, what situation is an alert good in? And then how do you turn 
the stupid alert off if it keeps going off, right? So if you're going to design a really, really sensitive uh, uh, alarm system for your kitchen, then you need to be able to like poke it with a broomstick to be able to turn it off, which is why the, um, the alarm system, uh, there was this big company that actually made a fire alarm that had a big button on it and you could you know, hit it with the end of a broomstick so you could turn it off. And that took like 80 or 90% of the market because it wasn't about the alert and the smoke detection, it was about how the hell do I turn it off so I'm not embarrassed and wake up everybody in the house when I'm trying to sneak you know, a snack at midnight, right? So you have to really think about the context in which people are using things. So if we're in an era of interruptive technology and we're getting way too much more information than we need, then we need the exact opposite of that, which is the era of what's called a calm technology. So where did this term come from? I always like to go back in time and say, okay, where did people get it right 20 or 30 years ago? And then what happened? Like usually somebody's already figured out or a group of people's figured it out and then we've forgotten. Uh, usually because somebody's written it down in, in a research paper that's hard to read or everybody's so obsessed with the new utopian scenarios that we're going to make that they forget that there have been many research groups that have come up with this stuff before. So these are kind of the, the founders of Calm Technology. There's Mark Weiser, there's John Seeley Brown. They worked at Xerox Park in the mid 80s and 90s and they created a series of research papers. Xerox Park was interesting back then. You had beanbag chairs that people would sit in um, and, and the beanbag chairs that people sat in during meetings were not there because it was some sort of hippie ideal. It was that all of the computer scientists kept interrupting each other. So somebody would go up to the, onto the board and they'd write something down and then somebody else would be like, oh, I have an idea, and they'd like interrupt them. So uh, beanbag chairs were installed so that uh, you sit down in a beanbag chair and you get really cozy. Suddenly you don't want to get up and interrupt somebody. <laughs> So by artificially slowing down how somebody could get back up out of the chair and kind of calming them down, they're like, oh, this is very interesting. What else can we calm down? So they were able to, to kind of take this to all of these different devices. Um, they had a lot of anthropologists and technologists there, a lot of people from the edges that were talking about humanistic user interfaces and how you could augment the human intellect. Mark Weiser wrote in his paper, uh, The Coming Age of Calm Technology, that we don't need smarter devices, we need smarter people. What are we doing? with these smart devices everywhere. They're never going to be as smart as humans, but they can help us get to the part where we as humans can curate our own experience. So let's talk about designing calm technology. Uh, there are a number of principles that were outlined just a little bit in these papers. So I took the liberty of making a few more principles uh, according to what we're dealing with in our age. So the first one is that technology shouldn't require all of our attention, just some of it, and only when necessary. And the example that Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown gave about this is the tea kettle. The tea kettle is a device that you set, you forget, you can be in another room, and when it's done, it will call attention to you with a status shout, right? Hey, you need to pay attention to this. But you don't have to sit there and watch it the whole time. It doesn't work like a desktop computer. And this is the main thing that Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown wrote about. They said, the world is not a desktop. We cannot design technology for the future in the same way that we can design desktop applications. Because think about a desktop computer. You're sitting down in front of it, and all of your attention is paid to the screen, the dashboard in front of you. You don't have anything else to do around you or anything else interrupting you in the original desktop scenario. But where are people using most of the technology now? It's in the shopping market, like trying to, to waste time before you get to the checkout. I wonder how many apps I can download before like, my turn is up and then I'll look rude because like, I'm still on my phone. Oh, I need to finish this article. So technology has moved from just being in this place that we can use all of our attention to being in places like the car. And now it's becoming very dangerous because we can't compute while we're in a car. I mean, a car was designed originally to hold all of our attention. Our primary attention's on the road. Our secondary attention is on our rear view windows. Our tertiary attention is on the radio and the knobs. And we can use that entire scenario to drive successfully down the street. But if we switch our attention even for a few seconds to our phone, all of those environmental variables that have been put into our head drop. And we load all of them in this kind of desktop environment that we're holding in our phones in the palm of our hand. And then when we switch back, we have to load back all those environmental variables. And so we get into car accidents more easily. So the idea behind this, this rule or this guideline is that you should just be able to get the information you need without being distracted from your current task, and you shouldn't have to be watching it all the time. 
And this goes along the lines of empowering the periphery. You have extremely high resolution vision right here. This is the desktop space. And as you get further and further away into your peripheral attention, you can still attune to many things, but it's lower resolution. Like right out here and all the way behind your back is the auditory realm. You can feel things on your body through haptics that you can't see. So if there's something buzzing in your pocket or around your wrist, you can still get that information without having to look at it and without having to take your attention away. So if you empower the periphery, you don't have to take somebody out of the environment, but you can still make them feel something or understand something without having to shift their attention. So this is a weather status light made with a hue light bulb. Have you ever seen those like, uh, like Microsoft videos, for instance, where the person wakes up in a perfect condominium, they're the only person there, it's entirely quiet, and some disembodied computer voice says, hello, Dave, check out the weather this morning. And just, it's really annoying, and it lasts about like this long. Check out the news headlines. You never see them getting frustrated and saying, off, right? Because it's this, again, utopian environment. But what happens if you're trying to use voice control and you don't have the perfect San Francisco accent? Or, you know, <laughs> or there's a truck driving by. It ends up making people look like uh, technology. I just heard something like, like a disembodied computer voice. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the idea behind this is that it can ambiently make you aware of the weather by changing the color of the light to the weather that is going to be for that day. So you can just walk into your kitchen and feel what the weather's going to be, and then if you want more information, you can look at the little iPad up on the wall that actually gives you the weather report. But you don't have to pause in order to get information from your environment auditorily. So you're not getting uh, distracted from your environment. So technology should be informative while in calming. Uh, this means that you can take all of the information from something and give somebody information, and you can do it in a few ways. You can do it by a dashboard view that's very complicated, or you can give somebody a feeling of the information. Um, one of the projects I'm working on right now is called Compass. It doesn't exist yet, um, but you can look at it at existence.io. Um, and the idea is that all of this information on your phone is invisible, yet you are uh, having all this data exhaust all day. So what this does is it takes all of your appointments and your photos and where you are just from your phone and then puts it into this kind of little layered approach. And so you can kind of dial into the future and you can dial back into the past. But you can kind of get this ambient understanding of what you've done. And instead of it saying, hey, you need to walk more, if you're having a bad day, we'll actually contact one of three people in your network and say, hey, you might want to get in touch with this person without sharing any of your information. And it's all stored on the device so you don't have to worry about any privacy issues. Because right now, we have all this data and it's being stored in the cloud and we don't have access to it. We don't really own it. So this allows you to keep all the data that's personal right next to you. Technology should be amplifying the best of technology and the best of humanity. Every time you have an issue where you try to do something and it doesn't work, like an automated parking mach ticket machine, you end up turning into a robot, right? You're like sitting there, putting the ticket into the machine and having it spit out. And if there's no human involved, then you're really, really stuck. There was an NPR episode about a technology startup that really wanted to automate all the BART ticket systems and all the BART ticket um, uh, assistance at the machines in, um, in San Francisco. And so one of the interviewers said, can you go down to the BART station and tell the woman there that you're going to automate her job? to her face, and the guy said, okay, and like walks downstairs. And he says, hi, I'm going to automate you with software. And the woman behind the service desk for the transit station said, that's a really funny idea, but people need me. And he said, well, why? Why can't we just use phones? And she says, well, imagine if your phone ran out of batteries and you couldn't have your digital ticket on you or you just came here from another country and you don't know English and you really want to get to a certain place or you're completely lost or the machine breaks or there's a server error. All of these people need to, to, to come up and talk to a human. And I've been doing this for 25 years and I love my job. And right on cue, this person comes up and is like, help, I need to figure out where I'm going, and my phone is out of batteries, and I can't get, you know. And so the guy kind of understands that you need to have a human in a loop. What technology is really, really, really good at is chunking up a bunch of data and grabbing it and sorting it. And then what humans are really good at is the end curation part, which is taking all that data and saying, that piece of data is the one that's relevant to the context that I'm in, which is why Google is such an elegant system. It's not automating everything. It's not telling you the thing that you need to look at. 
it's giving you a sheet of options of which you can pick the one that matches you and what your need is. But it's really a human switchboard. It's just connecting you to human knowledge that's been there before by using bots and indexing. But at the end of the day, it's about people and it's not about machines. It's about a symbiotic relationship. Every time you try to make a, a machine act like a human, you have horrible dystopian scenarios and you can get people stuck in horrible situations too. Like every time you have an automatic dosage at a hospital for some sort of medication and a system screws up, I mean, you're liable for, for the human loss of life. There should always be people checking that system to make sure and, and make sure that it's not automated enough that people just say, oh, well, that's, that's the medication, right? There's been a lot of issues with that. Here's an example of a really good job of this. This is Sleep Cycle. Does anyone use this app? Yay, okay, so Sleep Cycle. You turn your phone on, you turn it airplane mode, plug it in, put it under your pillow, and it uses the accelerometer and the gyroscope to figure out whether you're asleep or not. And then you set an alarm, let's say I set my alarm to 6 a.m., it's going to wake me up in the proper sleep cycle so I have the most sleep and I feel the most refreshed some point before six o'clock in the morning. And so what it does is the best of human and computer. The computer is measuring all my movements. I don't have to do anything. It's very calm. And then when I need to get the alert, I get the alert loud and clear. Wake up, but I'm more refreshed, right? Because it's in the right sleep cycle. Here's an example. This is like, there's like a graph over there of like the, the deep sleep and the REM cycles and things like that. But every, every morning I can like have four hours of sleep and be like da 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 instead of you know, having eight hours of sleep and waking up in the wrong cycle. So five, technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak all the time. I mean, how many of you have heard these horrible disembodied voices of technology that's trying to talk to you? It's just, it's not good. Voice concatenation is never going to be as good as human speech. Because again, it doesn't have context. It's switched, it's all these stitched together words. But you can actually have technology speak through these different senses. The first example of this uh, through Natalie Germanjenko under the advisement of Mark Weiser at Park Research was this live wire or dangling string. It's a piece of plastic descending from the ceiling at Xerox Park. And any time the local network had interesting activity on it, it would start to like whir. So it would go brrrr, and you could kind of hear it. And uh, it became this kind of water cooler. So people would walk around and ambiently, if this thing was like moving all over the place, people were like, oh, something interesting is going on. And they'd like run around the laboratory, like trying to find who was doing something interesting on the network. And there's just, just this great way of understanding network traffic. Um, I've had a lot of designers at like big web streaming companies come up to me after, after seeing this and say, hey, we're going to install one of those so that we can understand what's happening on our server. Like, because sometimes we don't know if there's some big event happening, like Game of Thrones season finale or something like that. And they're like, we can actually see it. Like, there are people on the network right now. Another example is using haptics or touch to automatically send people message without having to get in their way. So this Lumoback smart posture sensor, you wear it around your waist and whenever you slouch, I can see everybody's sitting up better now. <laughs> whenever you slouch, it buzzes you, but only when you're slouching. And so over time, you get this little indicator. Now, the reason why that this is really good with, uh, with just a buzz is that a buzz is a nice personal notification. Um, I had a coworker of mine get an insulin pump installed. Um, and the problem with the insulin pump was that it would beep. And it would beep not in a, in a totally loud manner, but you could still hear it if you were in a quiet coffee shop. And he would get really embarrassed. Like, I remember sitting there, and he beeped. And I was like, wow, your insulin pump. He's like, I'm really embarrassed by that. I said, well, they should have made a buzz because a buzz is more personal and it, was, and it would be for you and it wouldn't be distracting to everybody. So, you know, he goes into a movie theater and it's really quiet and beep, you know. And, and so you have to really understand, like, if it's personal and it's just for one person, make sure the data is close to the body as you can have it and then make sure the, um, the notification is in the right, is in the right shape uh, to get to that person without interrupting other people. The Roomba vacuum cleaner is fantastic because it doesn't say like, I finished cleaning, da da da. It just goes da da da. Like, you don't need to translate that into 60 different languages. And it has a light backup that's green or red. You know, oh, it needs to be cleaned. Okay, it's red. Oh, it's doing just fine, it's green. And it's excited when it's done, and it's excited to begin. It's just a very happy device. And the idea behind the Roomba is that, 
you know, you see like dogs and cats and they're terrified of vacuum cleaners. Like now cats ride on top of the vacuum cleaner. Like they love it. They're like, ooh, this is a great non-human ally and I can like hang out with this machine and like swat at the dog. So, the, so this, is, this is great because it's also based on nature, right? In nature, you have tr trilobites and filter feeders that are in this shape. There's even a competitor called the trilobite that, that cleans everything up in the same way. Because it's not one of those humanized robot shapes where technology is trying to be like a human, there's way less parts to actually maintain and fix on this robot, and it's way less expensive. And Helen, the person who created this, I saw her speak at, um, uh, at a venture capital conference in 2006, People were asking her, how'd you come up with this? She said, well, I was at MIT and I really didn't want to like walk, clean my floors all the time. So I thought, what if I made a robotic vacuum cleaner? So she went to get funding for it and they said, well, you need to make something for the government first. So why not make a really big version until you can get the parts cheap enough to make a tiny version? So there are giant Roombas roaming around doing bomb detection. Uh, and this is where the original thing came from. So you can imagine these like landmine detectors that are saving people's lives. And then after a couple years, it was cheap enough and she could miniaturize it. Like that's really great supply chain dynamics right there. Like just consider like saving people's lives through bomb detection first if you're gonna make anything interesting. <laughs> Mark Weiser talked about this status tone alarm clock. He said, wouldn't it be great if you got woken up with a series of tones that told you about your day? There would be like sharp tones if it was going to be an intense day and there would be kind of like slow lazy tones if, it was, if there was nothing on the calendar. I thought that was really cool. Of course, there are issues with that, right? Some people just put stuff on their calendar all over the place and it doesn't really mean anything. So you could wake up and have like all these sharp tones on like a Sunday morning because you, you put this like random thing like, hey, I wanna go to the coast today. And it's like, er, er, alert, go to the coast. <laughs> Technology should be respectful of human norms and social norms. Let me give you a little chart here. Uh, so there's a, there's a line right here. Like imagine this line that's the norm, right? And every few years, the norm changes. For a while, having a feature phone in your pocket was the norm. And for a while before that, not having any phone at all was the norm, just having a landline phone. And now, having a smartphone in your pocket is the norm, right? So the norm has changed. Anything above that norm that everybody has, we'll call enhancing. And usually that's where the fear-inducing technology comes in. Not everybody has it, it's expensive. Normal is kind of invisible technology, like the idea that we just use washer and dryer all the time, electricity is invisible and it's everywhere, we only notice when it breaks, and everybody has a phone in the audience, pretty much. And then anything that restores you to the norm, which at this point would be, hey, I need a phone because that restores me to the norm, and if I have my phone broken, then I'm temporarily disabled, right? Really strange idea. But all the restorative technology, like glasses and like prosthetic legs, those are accepted and they're not scary, because it's, it's getting somebody back to the human stated norm. So if we look at feature phones, you know, they, they had text and voice calls, the little brick phones that you had in your pocket. They had few apps and they were an evolution of the landline phone. It was basically cut the cord on the landline phone, get a wireless phone, and then suddenly it's free to like live in your pocket like a Tamagotchi and like beep at you and you can carry it around. But then when the smartphone camera happened, Again, it was an evolution on the feature phone, right? So people were just getting used to smartphones. Uh, sorry, people were just getting used to feature phones and then the smartphone showed up and all of these panic articles 10, 15 years ago came out. They said, oh no, it's the end of privacy and everybody's going to take pictures and then they banned them in dressing rooms and pools and all of these different places. But over time, people got used to it, right? Because at the time, you could get a smartphone. It wasn't too much more. And eventually we learned that when you hold your phone up and you press this button, you're taking a photo. And it turns out that not everybody on the street is so interesting that you want to take pictures of them all the time. So people didn't. But when Google Glass came out, it had tons and tons of features. People couldn't play with it. It was a closed network and it didn't really build on anything else that was out there. Plus it was really expensive and it was just mysterious. And when you have a product that has too many features, People usually lock on to the scariest enhanced one, which is, oh my gosh, somebody is taking video all the time out of their eye, right? Which in reality, you can try to tell everybody all you want that like, unless you tap here, you can't take a picture or a video, um, but they won't believe you, even though the battery life on them was pretty horrible because it's ambiguous. If you think about like an early, an early calm technology is the record light on a video camera. It's red, it's a status light, and when it's recording, it tells you and the person across from you that it's recording. But Google Glass didn't even have an indicator light like that. 
And with that ambiguity, bred tons and tons of fear, along with the price point and exclusivity and mystery. And so the results were this kind of reduced play. You couldn't hack into the platform. You couldn't, uh, you know, all you could do was kind of speculate it. And you just ended up being fearful. So I walked around with this awkwardly on just to see, just to make this really bad data visualization. I, I, need, I need Rachel Binks up here. But um, the, the biggest question everybody had is, are you recording me right now? And if they were between ages 10 and 24, they were like, oh, that's the coolest thing ever. Um, and then, you know, glass makes me feel uncomfortable. So let's look at the iPhone launch instead. The iPhone launch was an improvement on an existing system, making what was formerly a solid interface full of buttons liquid that you could press a button anywhere. The developer onboarding was really good. You, anybody could pay $99, get an emulator for it, and by the time it launched, there were all of these applications on the phone. And it was fantastic because people were just playing. Like people who were 14 years old could make a whoopee cushion app. And the minute I saw the whoopee cushion fart app, I was like, the iPhone's gonna be ridiculously successful. <laughs> because people have made something fun with it. They've replaced an existing object in the world with something on this phone, and that app in and of itself like, said, here's what the iPhone is good for, making silly things with the accelerometer and the push button. Right? And Google Glass never had any like, fun, silly app that you could do with it. All of the, all of the apps that people made were like, terrifying other than like the recipe app. It was like, hey, you can wink and it'll take a picture of everybody. Ah, that's really horrifying, right? So you really have to figure out like, there's kind of a metabolism rate, right, for every single feature. And it takes maybe a season or two for people to, to accept it. So if you're making some technology and you have this end state out there that's really complex, you have to say, okay, this six month period, we're gonna release this feature and we're gonna wait, and then we're gonna release this one, until you, especially if it's a physical product, until you get that supply chain set up, or you get in really, really big trouble, everybody panics, and then they hate it, and then you end up with like the QCAT, and I think the QCAT's really awesome, by the way, but some people really don't like it, right? You end up with these big failed projects. So finally, the, the right amount of technology is the minimum amount to solve the problem. What are you trying to solve? Take everything away until there's nothing left to, to take away, that famous designer quote. The whole idea behind this is you really don't need that much. And the problem is when, when design is really, really good, you just don't notice it anymore at all. Like this toilet occupied sign. This is brilliant because, again, it's a pictogram. There's a light behind it. It shows up and you can see it even if you're red, green, colorblind, if you don't know any language at all. And you know if you're five years old, you can understand it. You can see it without wearing glasses. And it just it lights up. It's really simple, right? Like this type of elegant system is now ubiquitous on all of these different airplanes. And so this is the type of like design that I'm talking about. How do you make it really simple so you don't have to translate it? And how do you make it so that everybody can understand it? Um, and this is just a status light, you know? With a, it's a light behind it. It doesn't connect to the internet. It's mechanical. You open the bathroom door and you shut it. And when it's locked, it turns on the sign. It's great. Technology should make use of the near and far. And this is the very last one. It's a fairly complicated chart, but the whole idea behind this is, in the beginning, we had mainframes, and they were far away from us. There were many people to one computer, and we had to do timeshare on them. Then computers got really close to us, and they showed up in our houses in the form of the desktop, and we had maybe one or two people per computer. Then we went up to the internet and to mobile phones and the remote mainframe, or cloud, and now we have, again, many people to one computer in the cloud, and we also have many devices to one person. But if we go back down that chain, we get the idea of personal servers, where you have these complicated computers in your pockets, and now we're making use of stuff in the cloud and we don't need to. We need to be making use of all of the power that's available in our pockets, and touch the cloud only when we need to, and not when we don't need to. Because you shouldn't have to go all the way to the internet to turn on and off the lights in your house, as you shouldn't have to be a system administrator to live in your own home, because that's near. So if the technology is near to you, in your house, you should be able to operate it right there. If it's far away, you can operate it far away. But people are not really making good use of resources, and they're not making good use of people's attention. So if you start to process as much as possible on the device itself, you get these fantastic outcomes where things are very fast, and you don't have all these issues where, oh no, the server went down that was remote in New York, and now you can't access your microwave. I put these principles of tech Calm Technology here, but they're also on the website, calmtechnology.com. You don't have to look at them for that long. I'm just 
I'm just here for people who are completionists. <laughs> so if good design allows people to accomplish the goals in the least amount of moves, then Calm Technology allows people to accomplish those same goals with the least amount of mental cost. Because as Mark Weiser said, the scarcest resource in the 21st century is not going to be technology, it's going to be our attention. And if our attention is endangered, how do we conserve it, and how do we make use of it, so that our primary task is not being computing, but instead being human? Because that's, after all, the joys in life are humanity. Why are we spending all of our time reconfiguring and downloading Apple TV updates when we just want to watch a movie? There's that quote again. I just finished a book on this. It's called Calm Technology, and there is a slow loris on the front. It's by O'Reilly. It's a tactical book. It's, very, it's not terribly technical, but the whole idea is here are some guidelines. Maybe it will save you millions of dollars. Maybe it will save you a lot of customer fails or expectations. And if it doesn't, let me know so I can update it and fix it, because it's digital, and I can always fix it. So um, thank you so much. <laughs>